Welcome to season one, episode three of Behind the Research with the Journal of the American Osteopathic Association. I'm Melissa Schmidt, director of the JAOA, and in this podcast, it's my pleasure to meet with authors of papers recently published in the journal to have comprehensive discussions about the research. Everything from results and methodology to their study process, expectations and surprises, the larger clinical and social context of their work, and their plans to build on these ideas in the future. My guest today is Dr. Harris Ahmed, one of the four authors on a paper from our September issue entitled Practice Locations of Michigan Ophthalmologists as a Model to Compare Practice Patterns of DO and MD Surgical Subspecialists. Of course, you can find the full article online at jaoa.org. Against the backdrop of a nationwide physician shortage, as well as the transition to single GME, Dr. Ahmed and his co-authors use Michigan as a case study, so to speak, to analyze the practice patterns of both osteopathic and allopathic ophthalmologists, identifying differences in the size and type of communities where each most often practices. By using data from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the American Osteopathic College of Ophthalmology, and the American Medical Association, as well as the US Census Bureau, they ultimately found that only 85 DO ophthalmologists were practicing in Michigan compared with 558 MDs. And of those 85 GOs, 67% were working in rural areas or urban clusters rather than more urbanized areas. So today, Dr. Ahmed and I will be chatting about what this higher proportion of DO subspecialists practicing in rural areas, which is a common pattern shown in previous literature as well, could mean about physician recruitment and training in the coming years. So welcome, Dr. Ahmed. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So I'm hoping we can start off, um, if you'll introduce yourself to the listeners and tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, my name is Haris Ahmed. I'm a resident physician now, PGY1 at Loma Linda University in Southern California. I'm training in ophthalmology. I was born and raised in Southern California. I was raised in the Inland Empire, which is San Bernardino and Riverside counties. They're health professional shortage areas. So I've kind of grown up in communities that don't have access to physicians as well as our neighboring counties do, like Orange County and LA County. I went to UCI for undergrad, then I went to USC for my MPH, and then I went to the Braille College of Osteopathic Medicine at New Mexico State University for medical school, and now I'm back home. Uh, I'm a huge Lakers and Dodgers fan, so I'm very <laughs> happy these days. I love and, uh, following you on Twitter for that reason. We get all the Lakers <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you so if you follow me on Twitter, you'll see that you'll have a lot of like health policy, public health, and then a lot of like sports. A lot of basketball. <laughs> just break yourself. Yeah, and I also just had we just had a newborn. My wife and I just had. She's six. Our daughter's name is Liana. She's seven weeks now as of uh, yesterday. So that's been a fun experience as well. I saw that congratulations are in order. And for those of you listening, before we turned on the record button today, Dr. Ahmed and I have been talking about his call schedule, but we did not talk about his newborn call schedule <laughs> in addition to that. So he was kind enough to join us after a good night's sleep. Um, I usually like to start off by asking my podcast guests kind of what connected you with your co-authors. So you have four co-authors on this paper. Did you all previously work together? Um, and is this your first research project you've undertaken as a group? Yeah, so we did not know each other before this. We actually met at a conference, American Osteopathic College of Ophthalmology and Head and Neck Surgery. They had their mid-year meeting in Detroit, Michigan when I was, I believe, my second year of medical school. And I went there to present research. And I was actually presenting research on rural eye care disparities. So I was, you know, I was giving that presentation and then they had a research symposium as a part of the conference. I went there and I was able to meet Dr. Brach and Dr. Robbins there. And we were talking about single accreditation because I was like, when it was still in the process, it was 2018. So it was still happening. The transition programs mm -hmm. are going from AOA to ACGME. There was some, you know, nervousness and excitement, a lot of emotions about how sure. what does this mean for our students. And so we started talking about, you know, are some of our programs going to close down? And if they close down, well, you know, how is that going to affect the ability of DO students to get into these, some of these fields since we're going to be losing a lot of the historic uh, AOA programs? And if at all, is it going to affect it at all? And so we kind of started talk talking, you know, literally at a round table. And uh, we came up with this idea of let's look at patterns of, of ophthalmologists right now and see if there's any meaningful difference in the way mm -hmm. DOs and MDs practice we know in, in primary care, there's a lot of data on this that DOs tend to practice more in high need areas, but there's nothing really 
uh, on ophthalmologists and very limited data on surgical specialists. So we wanted to look at that and see, you know, if, it, if there was any trend we could see or, or find. And from there, Dr. Price was brought in because Dr. Robbins knew Dr. Price. And uh, it was all that conference. Uh, we met through that conference. And to this day, we stay in touch and we've started on other projects as well. I think so often, you know, it's certainly the didactic lectures um, that are valuable at a conference, but equally, if not more so, it's those connections that you make in some of the breakout sessions or just passing one another in the hallway. Oh, yeah. um, and I think it's nice that you all could establish some baseline data sort of pre single GME so that you can compare that post single GME as well. Um, so your answer sort of uh, addressed a part of my next question, which is kind of what inspired you to do this research on the physician shortage. Um, I know that you published recently about this in Curious and gave an interview in the DO, the AOA's newsletter, where you mentioned a 2012 study by Fordyce et al. in Family Medicine, the journal. Um, were you specifically building on that particular research or just sort of using it um, to inform how you all would move forward? Yeah, so I wanna mention one other thing about the conference before I answer that. Sure. It's, it's a good, uh, like, I guess, you know, teaching point or lesson for, for myself and medical students that are trying to get into different fields is always being ready for an opportunity. And so mm -hmm. at that conference, before I had met Dr. Brach and Dr. Robbins, I was ready. I, you know, I went to go present research and an opportunity arose and I was able to take advantage of it. So, we, you know, our job as, as medical students is to always be ready for when that time comes. And it, sometimes it, it comes later or earlier, but, you know, our job is just to be prepared. So when, when that door opens, we're able to go walk right through it and, and you know, make something good out of it. But otherwise, we, you know, we can waste opportunities. So, and that's kind of a, a thing I wanted to mention, especially for medical students, is always be ready. You never know when your opportunity is going to come. I didn't expect that I would get into a project from that conference. But to answer your question about this paper, so it came up in actually in our literature review. It, it, it wasn't necessary. It was an important paper, but it wasn't necessarily the bait. Like it didn't inspire the, the creation of the paper itself, per se. Mm -hmm. It was very important and it was in the back of our minds. Uh, to even have the discussion about DO practice patterns. Sure. But for, for me, the reason it's kind of, it goes back to my life story. Like I mentioned, you know, I grew up in a health professional shortage area. So I kind of experienced what it's like to not have access to physicians and how that impacts the care of my family members and my friends, how some of their care was delayed or, or kind of maybe mismanaged or not managed appropriately. And that, you know, worse than their prognosis, their, their, disease state and and so I saw firsthand kind of the drawbacks of not having access to physician care so you know that's one part of it the other part of it is where I went to medical school and in in Las Cruces New Mexico at, at Baroque College of Osteopathic Medicine a lot of my classmates they came from high need areas they were a lot of them were from smaller communities and like me you think of Southern California you think of automatically big communities but you know like I said in the region that I'm from it, it's a health professional shortage area so I found that a lot of my classmates and colleagues in medical school were also from these shortage communities. And a lot of them had a desire, not all, but a lot of them to go back to high need areas. So I thought that was interesting to find that as a trend because before I went to medical school, I was in grad school at USC. And one of the things we studied was the phys physician shortage. And they would always say that, you know, we just can't get physicians to stay in these high need areas. Yeah. We struggle to get them there. That's why we have to look to non-physician providers and other, other uh, health professionals to fill the physician gaps in these high need areas because we just can't recruit people who want to stay in these areas. So when I went to medical school, I found that people in my class, a lot of these people wanted to stay. And then I went into national leadership for, for student osteopathic medical association for, for four years. And I met students from across the country, from every school, every deal school in the country. And I found that same trend again, mm -hmm. that a lot of these students, they are actively seeking out high need areas, high need communities. And so I knew that this couldn't really be a coincidence. So that is why, what inspired me then to go into looking into ophthalmology practice pattern, because I knew that I wanted to go into ophthalmology. And I said, you know, everywhere around me, in my case example, whether it's national leadership or my local school, these people tend to want to go to these high need areas. Mm -hmm. Is the same true for the field that I want to go into? So right, it was for really surgical subspecialists. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it was my experience really that, that got me into wanting to do this project. And when I shared this with Dr. Robbins and Dr. Brach at that conference, they we're excited about this idea and excited yeah. about this story. And so we were able to, you know, go ahead and study it. 
I, from a, a sort of journal director perspective, really appreciate that personal aspect. And I really enjoyed that about your interview with the DO because there isn't always opportunity um, in the context of presenting your research in a journal to talk about how your personal experiences inform that. Um, and I recently gave a presentation at OMED where I sort of talked about the academic research cycle and that often is the point of entry, especially for medical students, residents, fellows, is something either in your personal life or in your clinical experiences that you notice that causes you to wonder um, about something. And in this case, obviously, that was wondering whether those things that we know to be true um, about practice patterns for DOs in family medicine were also true in surgical subspecialties. So I, I love having that personal insight from you. Um, you mentioned kind of a case example. So let's talk a bit about using Michigan as case study in this research. It obviously was uniquely primed as kind of investigative ground for you. Um, and I want to quote a little bit from your paper. Michigan has seven medical schools, one of which is an osteopathic institution with three different locations. Michigan also features a higher proportion of practicing osteopathic physicians, DOs, compared with most other states in the country. Additionally, before the single GME transition that began in June 2015, there were four ophthalmology programs in Michigan accredited by the AOA, the most of any state in the nation. Are those distinguishing factors about Michigan kind of common knowledge amongst medical students and or DO professionals, or did you consider other states um, to conduct your research? Oh, that's a good question. It wasn't common knowledge uh, to us. I, I spoke with, you know, me and the authors, we, we spoke with uh, the American Osteopathic College of Ophthalmology head and neck surgery leadership. And we asked some of them what they thought about uh, this as a research topic. And they suggested Michigan for these reasons. They felt from their experience that, you know, there are more ophthalmologists in Michigan. And that was grounded by the data as well, as you mentioned, we then researched it. And Florida was, a, was an option as well, because Florida also has two ophthalmology programs now that were formerly AOA programs. But at the time of the paper, only one of them was going to get accreditation. Mm -hmm. And even before a single accreditation process, you know, as we mentioned, Michigan had the most programs. So the combination of already having the most programs before accreditation, having the most programs after accreditation up until that point, and having being one of the most populous states for DOs in the first place in general, we, Michigan made more sense to us at the end just because mm -hmm. we knew that the, that the sample size would be small regardless because ophthalmology yeah. as a field is very small. Right. When you combine MDs and DOs and then when you make it just DO and just MD, then it gets even smaller. So, you know, that's kind of why we went, went with Michigan, but Florida was, was definitely almost a thought. I think that's a good point about going to society and specialty society leadership to get some of that data to help you too. I think oftentimes um, maybe that doesn't happen as early as it could in a research project and then you end up selecting kind of a proving ground that doesn't necessarily give you the sample size you need. So I think that's yeah. Um, so you talked about this a little bit already. One of my questions was you specialize in ophthalmology so this might have been an obvious choice. Um, and you kind of addressed how some of those things, physician shortage in rural areas and the preponderance of ophthalmology programs in that area influenced your own specialty path. But let's circle back to the beginning when you kind of gave your introduction. How did you choose ophthalmology? Yeah, so for me, you know, I was an undergrad and I wanted to go, into, go to medical school. So when you apply, you need to have shadowing. So I went to my local mosque and I asked a physician that I knew I didn't know what kind of physician he was, but I asked him if, if I can shadow him. And he said he was going to Guatemala the next month or so, and I could go with him there. So that's not what I expected as a response. I thought I could just go to wherever his office was and just show up and drink some right. coffee and just walk around. But he, so then I asked my parents, obviously I was like 18 or 19. So I, you know, I spoke to my parents about it and they said, yeah, I should go. So I went with his, his organization that he's a part of called Humanity First. And we went to rural Guatemala and I saw him literally gave the blind the ability to see again. And I saw, you know, people, you know, husbands who couldn't see their, their wife for 10, 15 years because they were blind. And grandparents who couldn't see their grandkids. And, and they saw their grandkids for the first time because of the surgeries they got during that trip. Wow. And I was able to see some of it because the, the outcomes are relatively fast. It doesn't take months for your vision to come back after a cataract surgery. It's within even hours or days that you can see you know, much better. So seeing that impact that it had on people's ability to enjoy life 
and live life, but not just that, but survive. Because a lot of people, they need to see in order to work. So you're restoring the people's ability to work and you're sort of helping their local economy as well. So that made me want to go into ophthalmology. And then when I went to New Mexico for medical school, you know, I see that access to eye care is just as lacking in many countries and communities in America as it is yeah. in third world countries. So we don't even have to go to Guatemala or, you know, other countries to see lack of access to eye care. It's, it's in America, it's in rural communities. And so that made me realize that there's an opportunity here for me to serve in a way beyond medicine, but including public health and health policy within this field. So I knew that, you know, this is why I wanted to do it. And then I did, I did rotations. I love the technology. It was very cutting edge. I love microsurgery. I yeah. think uh, it's amazing the precision involved in that. And so there, I can go on for this question. I could answer for two and a half hours. <laughs> so I'll stop there. Well, and you and I could probably go very far down that rabbit hole. My first journal that I managed almost 20 years ago was the American Journal of Ophthalmology. So <laughs> you wow. and I have some commonality there. Um, wow. But that's a really interesting and formative experience at that age, particularly. I'm, I'm appreciative of you sharing that um, because I know, of course, you know, some medical students specialize much later in the process um, and aren't really sure what they want to do when they enter medical school, but that's, that's a really unique experience that you had. Um, in terms of your results, obviously I sort of gave a little rundown about this during the introduction, but you found that a greater proportion of DOs were working in rural areas, um, and it was about 67% of them, whereas a greater proportion of MDs to the tune of about 66% are working in much more urbanized areas. And of DOs, 28, so about 33% of your sample size practiced in cities with a population um, of at least 50,000 versus 371 MDs. So a lot of this research or results, I get the sense were not particularly surprising to you in the context of previous research about family medicine. Um, but as we talked about, it does lend some real specificity to how there's a general disproportion um, of DOs serving in rural areas and how that bears itself out, even in surgical subspecialty areas. Did any of the other results surprise you? I, I was a little bit surprised because there, there is this, there was this uh, kind of unspoken idea amongst certain people that, you know, this may hold true for primary care, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, once if a DO is doing, you know, orthopedic surgery or ENT or ophthalmology or plastic surgery, that they're going to go to the big city and that's what they, that's what's going to happen. It was, oh, that uh, you know, it, it, yeah. So, the, and, and so it was a little bit surprising from there, but generally, generally overall, I wasn't too surprised. And I think when you look at the way DO schools recruit students, it, it, it makes sense. So DO medical schools, if you look at the way that, where there are, where their locations are, they tend to be in higher need areas in the first place in under resourced settings in the first place, more so than allopathic or MD schools. Sure. And part of the reason for that is the accreditation standards are a little different. DO schools are accredited by COCA, MD schools are accredited by LCME. And LCME places a really strong emphasis on academic departments and research outputs and volumes. Infrastructure. Which is, yeah, which is important. <laughs> and COCA, it, it doesn't have as strong requirements for, you know, act research and having departments because they're creating schools in high, high need areas, under resourced settings. So the emphasis and focus is community-based medicine, uh, being on the ground and, you know, treating people more than doing research. Not that it's one or the other, but we're talking about emphasis here. So sure. because of that, deals are, have found a way to, you know, launch campuses in under-resourced settings and have done a successful job at it. And then as a result of that, they're recruiting more from these under-resourced communities because wherever you create a school, you're going to get more students from that area. It's, it's kind of a given. And not only that, you tend to attract people from other smaller communities if it's across the country. So people from my school in Las Cruces, New Mexico, although not all of us were from Southern New Mexico, a lot of us were from smaller communities in other parts of the country. And the reason why we were willing to go and we wanted to go to BCOM was because we imagined ourselves to be able to live there and be happy because they reminded us of our community back home. So when you look at the way we recruit students, the way we make schools and then how we, create GME, a lot of the GME pro programs that the former AOA used to accredit and that are historically DO are also in high need areas. It makes sense that after our training that we're going to end up practicing in those areas because that's kind of a lot of 
you know, where we come from. It's, 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 it's sure, part of our tradition. Sure, you're going to carry that out, that emphasis and that priority. That makes sense. Um, so speaking of single GME, in the JAOA article, you don't specifically address um, any particular proposal or potential impact of expanding GME to address the shortage, um, rather than expanding the use of non-physician providers and kind of what they're permitted to do. But I know from talking to you um, and reading the interview you did in the DO that that's really an issue about which you're passionate. You got kind of close to it in the article um, by saying evidence-based models are needed to guide policymakers and future decisions regarding approval or additions to ophthalmology training programs. Would you like to speak a little bit about your thoughts on GME expansion and legislation here? Yeah, so you know, we kind of touched upon it earlier, and, I, and when I talked about USC and how we would talk about physician shortage there, uh, and uh, in, in every public health circle uh, across the country, health policy, the physician shortage is, is a big discussion point, and oftentimes the discussion uh, all over the country that, that I hear, that you tend to hear, is that, you know, we can't get physicians in these high need areas, uh, legislators will say the same thing, but it doesn't really hold true, because when you look at the evidence, we know that there are programs like teaching health center, graduate medical education, like public service loan forgiveness, proven programs that retain physicians in high need areas. We also know that the data shows that physicians are likely to stay where they train for GME. There's about a 50 to 60%, depending on <clears throat> which data or study you look at, 50 to 60% of physicians will stay where they train for residency. So right. if you expand strategic residency spots in high need areas, through programs like TC, THC GME, which is a proven method of creating residency spots in high need areas, you're gonna re retain a lot of physicians there. So we have the ability to do it, but it requires investment. You have to expand THC GME. You have to support different bills. There's, there's one bill that I talk about in the Curious article and as well as the, the DO interview, it's the Resident Physician Shortage Reduction Act of 2019. That act, for example, it would create increased spots by 15,000 over five years. Mm -hmm. And it emphasizes spots in areas with, with hospitals that have new medical schools and they have, that emphasize community-based settings. And there's a bunch of other legislation uh, bills that I, that I talk about in the Curious article. And you'll notice a common trend because it can get confusing with all the different bills, you know, this bill and that bill, but there's a common trend. And the common trend or theme in all those bills is that you want to expand GME but in high need areas, a lot of times we say, you know, remove the Medicare cap. There's been a Medicare funding cap on GME since 1997. And people will say, well, let's just remove the cap. But if you just remove the cap, then the spots are probably going to increase in areas that are already saturated because that's what's happened the last 20 years. We've still had GME expansion despite the Medicare cap, but it's been disproportionately in the Northeast. So that's why you can't just open the, or the lift the Medicare cap. You have to lift the cap and then strategically expand. So I believe that programs like TAC, GME, PSLF are proven methods. And that's really the way to go of, of retaining physicians in these high need areas. And then the other part of it is like we mentioned recruitment and DO schools are doing a great job. They're opening in areas that are high need. They're recruiting students from under-resourced communities. And, and those are the, those increase the probability of a student or a physician staying there. When you raise us, make a school in a high need area, you recruit a student from a high need community, you make GME in a high need area, you're increasing the probability that that physician is going to stay in, a, in that, in those communities that need it the most. Sure. Which is, is crucial to really approach it from that 360 standpoint um, and not just from a fiscal standpoint. You also talked a little bit about, um, the fact that only two of the four formerly AOA accredited ophthalmology residencies in Michigan have successfully reached initial accreditation status by ACGME. Um, and you talk a little bit about potential implications of that. Obviously, as you mentioned earlier, the data that you analyzed in this study was from 2018 and represented kind of a baseline. Do you think anything has changed since you analyzed that data and since single GME was fully realized? Um, and are there things you think should have been considered that weren't when it comes to ophthalmology residencies? I think things are rel for the most part the same, but I think one thing that I've seen, and this is again, this is a personal experience case example, is that single GME has been actually really successful in the sense that 
we're seeing more and more MD students match into former DO residencies and DO students matching more into former MD residencies where there wasn't much overlap prior. So that's what I've been seeing uh, in my experience and the experience of many of my colleagues back in from some, you know, my national leadership position that's with SOMA. So I have a good gauge. The reason why I bring that up is because I have a good gauge of students from across the country because I made friendship and relationships through that. So I was able to see where they're going. And so what I see is that there's more overlap now between MDs and, and DOs going into their form, you know, each other's historical residency positions. I think one thing that might have been overlooked was, you know, the value of community-based medicine in general. It's mm -hmm. not necessary that every single residency or every single medical school has a bunch of research output, academic uh, research output. It's, you know, research is really important. I do. I love research. Uh, I, you know, I'm working on papers all the Thank time. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And I, it's critically important, but there's got to be some type of middle ground that we find in terms of the, you know, these high need areas, getting residency positions in these high need areas. Sometimes you have to emphasize more community-based practice and perhaps less research, uh, but not, a, not, you know, either or. And we're, again, back, going back to like emphasizing. And so I think one of the things that may have happened especially with respect to ophthalmology residencies is there may have, we may have overlooked the importance of keeping these positions in high need areas, as long as they're meeting surgical and clinical volume, which m most of them were, and they weren't necessarily meeting the faculty requirements. They weren't necessarily meeting the academic output requirements, but they were meeting clinical and surgical volume. And so we have to come up with a way to accommodate uh, you know, those type of programs. And I have research coming out on why those programs shut down. We did a survey of all those program directors of, for both ENT and ophthalmology. And we asked them, you know, why is it that you feel that, you know, your program shut down and what were some of the barriers you had? It's kind of a qualitative and quantitative uh, research and it's, it's, you know, under review right now. So we'll see what happens with that. But I think, you know, overall, single accreditation was outstanding. Uh, it opened up a lot of opportunities for everyone. And I think there's only 99% positives from it. So I'm very excited about it. Very happy that we did that. And uh, we'll see, you know, what happens. Things can change. But, you know, I'm confident that, you know, things will correct themselves. There are a couple of programs that were former AOA ophthalmology residency programs that didn't necessarily transition during the window between 2016 and 2020. But they are fully planning to get their accreditation in the, in the coming years. So okay. I think they'll be some positive changes. Great. So let's switch gears a little bit and talk about your kind of submission and publication process. Um, part of what I try to accomplish in these podcasts is to give some insight to past and future authors um, and especially young physicians undertaking their first few research projects about what that process is really like. Um, so how did you divide the work amongst your co-authors? So this is another great kind of teaching point for medical students is when, you know, you, you kind of create a project and, you know, you get an opportunity, it's you have to take ownership and you have to drive the project. And so I was really, you know, a, a pretty significant driver in, in making the, the, the kind of the framework happen, getting the first draft done, doing the legwork, you know, doing whatever it took to get a coherent first draft. And that, that's kind of what was my job is to make sure I'd, I'd get all that done. And I took ownership and initiative and I did that. And then our senior authors, Dr. Brage, Dr. Robbins, they helped throughout the process. They helped with planning. So I wasn't just going into a blind to help with, you know, creating the, you know, fine tuning the idea and right. giving the guidance as we're going. And then their greatest help and assistance was then reviewing the drafts, enhancing them, giving, sending back questions. We had like this internal review process, same with Dr. Price, using their experience, their expertise, uh, and telling me, okay, this is what we need to do. This is what we need to change. We're approaching this the wrong way. Let's uh, look at, you know, let's look at this differently. And so for us, it was me kind of driving the, the creation of the drafts and it, with their guidance. And then it was them then, you know, enhancing it further and changing the perspective and, and making it stronger uh, in, through the internal review process. So it was, it was a really nice balance, I felt. Were there any particular tools that were helpful to you in terms of data storage or exchanging files? Were you using like Microsoft Word and emailing it back and forth? Um, or did you have different programs? 
Yeah, so we used, so one thing we did is we contacted the American Medical Association. We got their physician master file. We contacted American Osteopathic College of Ophthalmology, head and neck surgery. We got their master file. So we combined their data sets. And then online, there's a CMS, you know, you can find every physician and where they practice uh, on Google. If you just Google and CMS as a website. So we used those three data sets and then we had Excel. So we used an Excel sheet. And another thing I'll say is sometimes if as a student or as a resident, or it may seem intimidating that, okay, I have to reach out to the AMA for their master file. How's that going to happen? Because we think of these organizations as, you know, these ideas, but they're actually organizations and <laughs> they have people and you can contact them and they'll give you the data set and it works out and there's no issue. It seems intimidating some of these things, but they're really not. It's just a matter of a phone call and an email and you'll get whatever data you need. And definitely Excel and Microsoft Word were huge uh, to help us. And we also used this a program to help us make those maps. So, and it was all, you know, very low cost and uh, we were able to do it. And it, it seems intimidating, some of these steps, but you know, they're really not, there's a lot of tools out there to help you facilitate data storage, data, you know, acquiring data, analyzing it. There's also SPSS, which is a statistical mm -hmm. software that we use to break down some of the data uh, that we were accumulating. So, and that was Dr. Brach is huge on that. He was the, the statistics master. He was the one who broke everything down statistically. And I took the, kind of got the raw data and he made it into a meaningful data set. So that's another good thing about when you make a research team, you kind of figure out, okay, who is the expert on the topic? Who can do like statistics? Who's really good at lit review? Who's, who's going to do the conclusion? You kind of want people who are stronger than others in certain suits so you can kind of have a synergy and you can, and you can maximize each other's potential. And so that's what we did is we kind of analyzed, okay, you can do this. I can do the research. Uh, he's, he's an expert and it worked out really well. I think that's really helpful to talk about kind of specialization in a research project. So you're not doing anything redundant, but you're also getting people who are expert in specific things. As you said, having a statistic statistics whiz on board is um, helpful. <laughs> that's one of my first yeah. recommendations to young researchers. Contact your um, organizational librarian and find a statistics um, expert. So Let's talk about taking the project all the way to publication. What was the most difficult part about peer review for you? Um, and how did you handle revision requests? I know those can be intimidating to a lot of authors. Yeah, that's another thing. So it can be demoralizing when you feel like, you know, you and your team, you guys reviewed it a bunch of times. Like I said, with, with us, we had like this internal review system and you submit it and you think you're so excited that, oh, this is it, you know, slam dunk. And then you get a, you know, revision, a re, you know, a re rejection or not rejection, but a re revision request. And it's, it's, you know, you feel really down about it initially, but then you realize that it's a part of the process. And you have to remind yourself that the goal is not to get a publication. The goal is to contribute meaningfully to society and through your research. And that's, well, that was what our, our goal was. We wanted through public health and health policy to provide some meaningful information so that we could make better decisions as policymakers. We wanted to give back to society. So when we're getting these revisions, you know, these, these reviewers are taking their time and effort to go through our document and they're looking at it from a third party perspective, a fresh perspective, and they're coming up with these new ideas and, and you know, these weaknesses that we may have, these holes we, we have, and they're giving us an opportunity to fix it and revise it. And so you have to really approach it. You have to have the right mindset when you get the revision and uh, when you submit it, and for us, we had like eight or nine revisions, I think. I was, it was the most I've ever had. And it speaks to, I think, the, the attention to detail that the journal has and the outstanding reviewers because they, don't, they, didn't, they weren't, they weren't going to accept anything less than excellent. And through their revision process, you know, we were able to enhance our paper, make it more readable, and make it more accessible, more meaningful. And one thing I think another issue we ran into was just, breaking information down into a meaningful way. And I've learned that complexity is not always uh, what's ideal. You don't necessarily want this very complex language and kind of hardcore terms because then people don't really understand what, the, what, the, what it means. So translating your results into meaningful take home messages is really important. And that's one thing that I learned from this. It doesn't necessarily have to be this very fancy clinical trial for it to be meaningful research. You can do something like we did where you look at practice patterns and implications for public health and health policy. And that also has a lot of value as do clinical trials. And so, you know, it was a great experience. Uh, you know, I really enjoyed it. Uh, it was sometimes it was hard with the revisions, but 
you have to, you know, you have to approach it the right way. And I think that we did that. I really so appreciate your focus on meaning in that answer. Um, you know, going back to your comments earlier about emphasis on research versus on clinical practice. Um, I think balancing those things, as you said, is, is so important. I obviously believe wholeheartedly in the ability of research to impact and improve clinical practice. Um, but at the end of the day, as you said, publication for publication's sake is not necessarily, um, first of all, the thing that's motivating to researchers, but second of all, not something that's going to change or affect patient care at the end of the day. So conducting research um, and going through the revision and editing process in a way that renders a final result that is meaningful really is the point. Um, and I think a lot of people get very frustrated during the revision process for that oh, reason, yeah. feeling like I submitted something that's bulletproof <laughs> um, yeah. and then, you know, people poked holes in it. But really our, our shared commitment, um, authors, editors, peer reviewers alike is, is to, at the end of the day, contribute something meaningful that isn't just, you know, kind of another drop in the ocean of research that um, threatens to drown us all every day. <laughs> Um, so I have two questions to end. What did you learn during this research project that you'll take into the next one and kind of what's the next step with this research for you? I know you mentioned you have another paper, um, under yeah. consideration in peer review. So what's next here? So yeah, what's, what's next is, you know, we want to find out the programs that closed, you know, why was it that they closed? So we're trying to explore that question. What is it about the programs that caused them to close? Was it because they were completely, you know, were, were not, un, they were unacceptable from a clinical and surgical outcomes perspective? Were they producing, uh, you know, you know, incompetency or anything like that? Or was it, you know, a technical issue like the sites that they rotated at were too distant from each other? Mm -hmm. Or they needed to have X amount of faculty and they had, you know, a Y amount of faculty. And, you know, what are the reasons why? Was it a financial decision? Was it because the hospital felt that they didn't have enough finances to invest to maintain the program currently so those are the questions that we had you know what is it about the programs and why did they close and and because we feel that that former AOA model of residency is a really effective way of getting physicians in high need areas and that's what it kind of comes back to in the same way where our DO schools are a really effective way of creating medical schools in high need areas our res our former residency programs are the same way so we want to make sure that you know we're able to keep that tradition going where the DOs are are you know at, at the high need areas high need communities providing that high need relief and so that's kind of the next the next step for us another thing is you know to, to other do's is you know we should be leaders in this type of research you know rural research community-based research you know underserved medicine or whatever you want to call it in terms of public health health policy this is an opportunity where we are the experts because of the communities we train in and, and come from so we should really be leading i think on, on this realm. And, and the last thing I learned was just, you know, clinical research is extremely important, is extremely, extremely important. And so can public health and health policy research be. And, and that was another take home message for me is that, you know, it's, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a randomized clinical control trial, which is extremely important, but you can also make an impact by studying public health and by, you know, putting in health policy work. I agree. I could not have said that last part better at all. Um, I really appreciate you doing this meaningful work and bringing it to the JAOA to publish. Um, and I thank you for your time today. Thank you so much.